Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 86 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest for today is Dr. Frederick H. White. Dr. White is professor of Russian and Integrated Studies at Utah Valley University. He's also a fellow of the UVU Center for National Security. He's published eight books and more than 45 academic articles on Russian literature, film, and culture. His current project is titled Ernest Hemingway and the Soviet Union. I invited Dr. White onto the podcast today after learning about his extensive research into the life of Ernest Hemingway, one of America's most famous authors and cultural figures. Hemingway lived a fascinating and complex life, and it came as a surprise to me when I learned recently that for a period of time he was of great interest to the Soviet government, including to the NKVD intelligence organization. I wanted to learn more about how his life intertwined with international affairs and espionage, and Dr. White is the perfect person to learn from. But before we dive into this story, I want to ask you, the listener, a question. Has this podcast given you a renewed interest in the history of the Cold War? Do you want to share that interest with others? Well, now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-Minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game. With the two expansion packs currently available or using the brand new Complete Edition, up to 10 players can battle each other for global domination. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, use your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Penkovsky weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing, just learn the color codes and point values of each card. My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won two rounds against her mom and I. You can also use the new speed tokens to boost the rate of play by up to 50% for large multiplayer games for when the Cold War turns hot. If you've heard me mention 15-minute Cold War before, there are two brand new updates you should know about. Starting now, any order for more than $50 gets free worldwide shipping. And if you use the discount code SPYCRAFT101, you'll get 15% off your entire order. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15min coldwar.com. And make sure to follow at 15 Minute Cold War on Instagram. Dr. White, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. I appreciate your time. I know that you're very busy and we've been kind of planning this for a while now. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to hear from you about this very, very interesting topic. I appreciate it. I look forward to the conversation. <laughs> Thanks. So what was it that led you to study Ernest Hemingway and his involvement with the Soviet government in the first place? Certainly. Originally, I was interested mainly in why Hemingway had been translated into Russian. Who had done the translations and how had they become so incredibly popular in the USSR? However, as I was doing my research, I found that as early as 1936, the Soviet government was actually interested in cultivating a relationship with Hemingway. This led to other findings that now form kind of what I would consider a, a second layer to my research, and that is Hemingway's relationship with the NKVD, which was, your listeners probably know, was the precursor to the KGB. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. They've, they've come up many times, but honestly, it's such an endlessly fascinating topic that I love to revisit them because of, there's so many different aspects to approach that topic from. So I know that most of my listeners are familiar with the name Ernest Hemingway and probably some of his work, but can you talk a little bit about just how influential Hemingway was in his day? Yeah, certainly. Hemingway probably was first known best for his short stories, but mm. it was actually his first novel, The Sun Also Rises, published in 1926, that brought him to the kind of the, the broader attention of the American reading public. He then scored another success 
with A Farewell to Arms in 1929. And both of these novels struggle in one way or another with the devastating effects of World War I and led to this concept of the, the lost generation. Hemingway's then next major literary success was For Whom the Bell Tolls from 1940, and this captured Hemingway's experiences in the Spanish Civil War. His last major success was the novella The Old Man and the Sea from 1952, and this led Hemingway to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954. Hmm. Yeah, those are very, very well-known American novels and novellas, like you mentioned, short stories as well. Was he primarily known around this time in the United States, or was he like a worldwide phenomenon already by the time that he published The Old Man and the Sea, for example? Yeah, he was certainly a worldwide phenomenon. He had been read, you know, and translated broadly. Of course, my interest is in how the Soviets came to him. And what's interesting is, is that he really was published for the first time in 1934 in Russian. There's a, a translator who, in my world, is well known. His name is Ivan Kashkin. And Kashkin had formed his own group of translators who sp specifically worked on the works of Hemingway. And in many ways, he would later talk about Kashkin would of my Hemingway. It was kind of like a, a Soviet version. So sometimes I talk about like a Soviet Hemingway and an American Hemingway because they're not necessarily the same. In 1934, they published these short stories, but then in rather quick succession, they also translated and then published the novels. So The Sun Also Rises and then A Farewell to Arms. What's interesting about this, though, is that whereas in the United States and even in Europe and England, so forth and so on, The Sun Also Rises was this really important work. In the Soviet Union, it was connected to literary modernism, which was in direct conflict with the official cultural policy of the USSR called socialist realism. So actually, most readers in the Soviet Union paid more attention to A Farewell to Arms. Um, the, what's interesting, as I noted, is that around 1936, then, the Soviet government became interested in cultivating a relationship with Hemingway. And his translator, Kashkin, actually wrote to Hemingway, and Hemingway wrote back. And this established a, a, a pretty interesting relationship between the two of them that lasted until the 1960s. Both of them actually died in the 1960s. And so we have this relationship between Kashkin and Hemingway kind of developing. We have Hemingway being translated into Russian. We have the Soviet government becoming more and more interested in a relationship with Hemingway. And then suddenly kind of around 1935, Hemingway starts to move a little to the left politically. And this seemed like a really exciting opportunity for the Soviets. And so within the Soviet Union, everything around kind of 1935 to 39 is published almost immediately into Russian. And the Soviets kind of try to build out that relationship. Now, and we'll talk about this later, in 1940 then, he publishes For Whom the Bell Tolls, and the Soviets don't particularly appreciate that. And so Hemingway becomes persona non grata then from 1940 until the mid-1950s within the Soviet hmm. Union. It's only with the publication of The Old Man and the Sea and him winning the Nobel Prize that those people who wanted to reintroduce Hemingway to Soviet readers, they, they were able to do that. And so we see this brief kind of second period, if you will, of Hemingway's popularity in the kind of mid to late 50s and 60s. Okay, I see. And so you mentioned that very early on, like 1934, the Soviet government had an interest. What was their initial professional interest in him? Was it just, you know, his purely in his literature or was it already seen as him being potentially like an agent of influence in the U.S. or someone that was potentially malleable or, or, or something totally different? Yeah, so the Soviets were cultivating relationships with a lot of leftist writers in Europe and in the United States. You have to remember that you had the rise of fascism, but you still had this kind of last belief that there could be a world communist world revolution, right? And so these two political forces were vying with each other throughout the world. And so the, the, the Soviets were trying to make friends, if you will, with left-leaning intellectuals around the world. 
Hemingway was not a communist, and he wasn't even really left-leaning, but he was incredibly, incredibly popular. And so he kind of came on the Soviet radar first for his massive popularity. But then, as I noted, in 1935, there were a few events that occurred that pushed seemed to push Hemingway a little to the left. And the Soviets saw this as an opportunity to develop that relationship. Okay, I see. And how was he viewed by the like the Soviet reading public? Did they view him in the same way that American audiences viewed him? I mean, they were coming from a very different culture and history and that sort of thing. So did he kind of, was he popular for the very same reasons in America and the Soviet Union or for different reasons? Really for different reasons. And this is part of my research has kind of revealed this to me. And, and it's quite fascinating. You know, for most Americans, we're not talking about professors of English or whatever, but for most Americans, we kind of associate Hemingway with Paris of the 1920s, bullfighting, big game hunting, maybe, and fishing in the Gulf Stream, this kind of uber, you know, masculine individual. And the Soviets, however, came to Hemingway from a different, as you noted, perspective. And his high point within the Soviet Union, at least in what I call the first period or the literary period, this is that 1930s period, really revolved mainly around his activities during the Spanish Civil War. And so where, this, where you know, we look at The Sun Also Rises, for example, as this kind of emblematic work of the lost generation, Paris of the 1920s bullfighting, the, the Soviets and even the Russians to this day still preference works like Hemingway's play, The Fifth Column, which probably a lot of American wouldn't even know about, or the novel To Have and Have Not, because these were the works in which Hemingway started to kind of look like he was shifting closer to the Soviet political perspective. So there is really two different, as far as I'm concerned, two different Hemingways. There's the American Hemingway and there's the Soviet Hemingway. And the Soviet Hemingway is very much kind of 1936 to 1939 uh, uh, and the heroics around the Spanish Civil War. Hmm. Okay. The Spanish Civil War, that's a topic that I've kind of touched on here and there without really ever getting very deep into it. But it seems to pop up more and more in my research because it was kind of the origin of, of so many things, like so many people kind of, that were major, major players in the 40s, 50s and on, they kind of cut their teeth in the Spanish Civil War in a big way. So can you talk a little bit about the significance of the war, in particular how it related to Hemingway? Certainly. You know, we now can in some ways look at the Spanish Civil War as the precursor to World War II, as I had noted just a second ago, we have these two forces vying, right? These two political forces, fascism and communism. This is where, in some ways, they clashed for the first time. So in 1936, there was a Spanish military tried to overthrow the democratically elected leftist government of the republic. The nationalists were led by the military general Francisco Franco, and they actually received aid from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. The Republican side then ultimately was supported by the Soviet Union and Mexico. And, and Joseph Stalin had originally hoped that as he started helping the Republican side, that maybe England or France or the United States would join and kind of buffet that support. However, they didn't do that. And so instead, what happened was the Comintern, the Communist International that was set up to work with communists throughout the world, tried to bring in communists from other parts of the world to fight in what was eventually called the International Brigade. The problem is, is that for all the efforts of the, of the Soviet Union, Mexico, and the, the efforts of the International Brigade, the truth of the matter is the nationalists were just better supplied. And by 1939, the Republic fell. Now, Hemingway was on the side of the Republic. Many of his friends were kind of left-leaning, plus he himself empathized with what had occurred or what was occurring to the Republic. And so he went there officially as a journalist to cover the Spanish Civil War. Okay. Okay. I see. And you mentioned the the Soviets were interested or, or were hoping that some of the other Western powers would kind of align on their side. Did they have any like far reaching goals for the war? Or did they simply want to kind of support, you know, left-leaning communist forces in another country? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of difficult maybe to, to say exactly what the, what Stalin hoped to get out of Spain, but certainly 
you know, the, the storm clouds were forming, right? Mm-hmm. And Stalin was looking to see who his allies were going to be going forward. And so this kind of action in Spain with the hope that England or France or the United States would join was in some ways a kind of, a, if you want a trial balloon, right? Mm-hmm. To see if they were going to be able to work together. Something similar later happens in Czechoslovakia as well. You know, the Germans claim a certain part of the Sudetenland as German and the Soviets are kind of looking at the Americans. They're looking at the French. They're looking at the British to see if like anybody is going to to step in and to defend or to even more so kind of push back Nazi Germany. And the reality is, is that they don't. France and England and the United States want to stay on the sideline. And this actually informs then the choices that Stalin made going forward. Hmm. I see. I see. And you mentioned this international brigade a moment ago. How meaningful was the formation and the inclusion of the international brigade in the kind of the conduct of the whole war? I know that the Nationalists ultimately did not win, but was the International Brigade, were they like a, a major influence on the on the conduct of the war? Yeah, to take a step back again to Comintern, what we have to remember is that under Lenin, the original idea of the communist revolution was that it wasn't going to just stop in Russia, that it eventually, because Russia wasn't really prepared they weren't a industrialized nation mm-hmm. um, that was prepared to follow the line of Marx the way Marx had set it out. Lenin and the Bolsheviks had been a kind of a vanguard party that thought they could kind of push the push the issues forward and how they would push the issues forward of Marxism and the development of a proletariat and all that is that other countries then in Europe would eventually fall right to the way of communism. And we have to keep in mind that, you know, there was a communist movement in Germany, there was a communist movement in France, there was a communist movement in Italy. And so, you know, the fact that some of these places fell to the sides of the Nazis meant that they didn't fall to the side of the communists. And so to facilitate some of that action, as I said, Comintern or the Communist International had been formed and so when the Spanish Civil War started, it it seemed realistic that Comintern would then try to collect all of these European and American communists to come over and fight. And so officially, officially, Comintern was in charge of the international brigades. But in reality, Stalin had them organized by the NKVD. So you have the NKVD who's actually training them, getting them ready to fight so forth and so on. And they were, in fact, very helpful in the beginning. I mean, keep in mind that on the nationalist side, Franco had the Spanish military. Most of the kind of military might was on on that side. So Stalin, you know, had to take a bunch of Spanish farmers and, and Spanish day laborers and turn them into an army. And the quickest way to do that, obviously, was to bring in these European and American communists put them as a fighting force and they really did rely on the on their military experience and expertise while the kind of the Spanish Republic was standing up its own army. Okay, okay. I see. So is it accurate to say that the common term at that time was just another name for the Incavide or was that like a totally separate organization that just received like a lot of assistance in Spain by the Incavide? Well, the the Comintern certainly was funded by and directed by the Kremlin in Moscow, but but we have to keep in mind that there were free actors in this, right? So there were German communists mm-hmm. and there were Italian communists. The NKVD, however, was more easily controlled, if you will, directed by Stalin and the Kremlin, and so on the outward facing you know, international brigade side, it looked like it was Comintern because that made the most sense, Mm -hmm. right? But organizationally, who really was pulling the strings and kind of moving people around and training and all of these kind of things, that was actually the NKVD. And so, you know, Stalin saw this as a a kind of a, a reason to expend those resources and not leave it up to Comintern to figure out whether they could get themselves organized or not. Okay. I see. So did this involve like sending people back to the Soviet Union for training or was it like Incaveta trainers that came in and taught the the farmers that you mentioned like on the ground and then put them right into the fight or somewhere in between? 
Yeah, it was a little bit of everything. So almost immediately, Stalin sent the NKVD to organize the republic. And so, for example, some generals, Spanish generals were sent back to Moscow for training. In other cases, clearly through the international brigades, European generals and military experts who had been trained in Moscow previously, or maybe had participated in the Russian Civil War, they were brought in, right, to help, as you you note, to turn these Spanish farmers into a fighting force. And so it was a little bit of both. The Soviets had a central command post in Madrid at the, the Gaylord Hotel. And this was kind of where all activities were organized. So officially, it might be Comintern that's that's supposedly doing this, but really most of the decisions were made in the Hotel Gaylord. And then later, of course, it was moved to the Majestic Hotel in Valencia. But it was in Madrid, for example, that Alexander Orlov, the Madrid station chief, set up and ran guerrilla camps and spy networks. Hmm. And so that was all NKVD activity. Okay. Okay, I see. Do you happen to know like how many people or how large of an organization this was? Like, is it, are we talking about like thousands of incubator or operatives or trainers, or is it just like a core group? You know, that could that could fit into a single hotel, for example. You know, a core group of of trainers and and influential people. Yeah, I, some of that's hard to to say exactly because. I mean, we know some of the names and we can pick out some of the people because, you know, for whatever reason, they become famous or they become part of the historical record. But the Soviets were really trying to hide this connection. So almost everybody at that time had an alias and they all had aliases that were Spanish or some other name that didn't connect them directly back to Russia or or where their their origin, original origin was from. So, you know, it, it, in t- even to this day, there's a little bit of this kind of back and forth, like, oh, I was looking at this person and this person went by three or four different aliases. And so then you start to figure out that that wasn't four people. That was really one oh, person, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, so figuring out exact numbers is difficult. And as we'll probably talk about too, there was a lot of infighting that was occurring anyway, during this time. And so who exactly was on the side of the Stalinist effort and who eventually wasn't also becomes an issue as we go along with the Spanish Civil War. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I see it. Yeah. That's a, that must be a complex and difficult project to work on. Then if you've got multiple aliases by all these people running around and the factions within factions and that sort of thing. We'll be right back. When was the last time you delved into the world of Australian agriculture? It's as diverse as it is professional, as it is captivating. Growing Marin definitely runs in my veins. AgriFutures On Air shines a light on the developments in ag science. Blueberry and aphid, it's like the mosquitoes of the plant world. Rural communities and national challenges and opportunities. We've got so many people around to help the young farmer get up and going. Treat yourself and join us on AgriFutures On Air wherever you get your podcasts. So, yes, definitely. It gets it gets dirty <laughs> very quickly. I believe, it. I believe it. So how exactly and when exactly does Hemingway fit into all of this? Like, what was it that brought him to cover the Spanish Civil War, as you mentioned earlier? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we all know that Hemingway had a kind of a long relationship with Spain and, you know, that goes back as we've talked about and is kind of displayed in Sun Also Rises. He was an aficionado of Spanish bullfighting. He also had friends who were kind of left-leaning and and interested in Spain, including John Dos Passos. And so Hemingway kind of got pulled in originally into a film project called The Spanish Earth, which was meant to be kind of a propaganda film to portray to the West the plight of the Republic. There had been an earlier film, Spain in, in Flames, that, that had been basically put together by existing films that were out there and were kind of re-spliced and put together. But then Hemingway and John Dos Passos and some other kind of folks decided, no, you know what, we really need to make our own film. And so part of the reason that Hemingway decided to go to Spain as a foreign correspondent, that was his kind of entry into back into Spain was so that they could continue to make this film, The Spanish Earth. Hmm. Okay. 
I see. And from what I recall from reading some of your articles, he makes like a, a very good friend or a very close contact, a Russian there. I believe his name was Koltsov. Is that correct? Is that Was that his primary contact among the Russian element there in Spain at that time? That's correct. Yeah. Mikhail Koltsov. Yeah. So can you tell me about so him Kultsov, exactly? How did they come to know each other? Yeah. 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 So Koltsov is actually a, a really interesting person. He officially, he was in Spain as a journalist for Pravda. However, almost everybody seemed to know that he was the eyes and ears of Stalin in Spain. And so Hemingway comes to Spain and he's working with the Dutch filmmaker Joris Ivans. And Ivans introduces him to Kaltsov. Joris Ivans had been a member of Comintern, and he had actually made some documentary films in the Soviet Union. So he knew Kaltsov. Ivans realized that Kaltsov was kind of running the show. Ivans was bringing Hemingway into Spain so that they could keep working on the Spanish Earth. And so he puts the two, Kaltsov and Hemingway, together. And I, I would imagine that for Hemingway, it was really clear almost immediately that Kaltsov was in charge. And so, of course, Kaltsov sees Hemingway and knows immediately who he is. He's like, the, by this point, one of the leading American writers of the period. And so it, it's my, my position that both of them realized what they could get out of the other person, right? And so this was the kind of the flourishing, if you will, of their relationship. Kaltsov was willing to provide Hemingway with inside information or what Hemingway would eventually call true gen. And of course, for the Soviets, if Hemingway actually transmitted any Soviet propaganda, that was going to be a major win for them. And so again, this, this seemed like a, a mutually beneficial relationship that the two could have. Okay, I see. So they had this, it, it's clear the, the, the benefits, the mutual benefits of it, but these guys, did they also strike up like a, a personal friendship or was it more about kind of taking advantage of each other's positions? No, I, I think that, you know, there's some distinct similarities between the two of them. Kaltsov was a well-known journalist in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and he had this reputation a little bit for being where the action was. And certainly Hemingway had the same. Kaltsov had covered aviation when it was still pretty kind of dangerous and exciting. And so Heming or so sorry, Kaltsov was known as a bit of a daredevil. He was also allowed to travel abroad and be a foreign correspondent, probably because of his connections to the NKVD. And he also was in some ways a cultural ambassador for the Soviet Union. He was one of these people who was out there cultivating relationships with left-leaning writers and cultural figures in Europe. He hosted these lavish parties at his apartment in Moscow. And it was where the kind of the, the high Soviet command and the and European intellectuals would mix, right? And so much like Hemingway, Kaltsov had this kind of outsized persona. He courted danger. He lived dangerously, right? And so I think that when Hemingway saw Kaltsov, he saw, even though physically they were very different, I, I think he, he saw that he was looking kind of at someone he could understand. Kaltsov, I mean, it's just kind of interesting. Kaltsov was actually short and stocky, but he was very well dressed. He was he was known to be a pristine dresser. And Martha Gellhorn, who ended up becoming Hemingway's third wife, suggested that 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 Kaltsov looked more French than he did Russian. Hmm. So I think there was much more there than just I'm going to use you and you're going to use me. I, I do think there was a genuine friendship there. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, striking up a relationship like that between two such influential guys in the middle of a dynamic war zone there in Western Europe. That's got to be an amazing relationship and time and place and everything. Yeah, for sure. So how did Hemingway end up writing about the Spanish Civil War? I mean, was it in a way that the Soviets had anticipated or that Koltsov had anticipated? Yeah. So, and for me, this is where things get really interesting, right? So Kaltsov being the eyes and ears of Stalin gives Hemingway this incredible access to people and to places that would normally be completely off limit to any non-communist. 
For example, Hemingway was allowed to regularly dine at the Hotel Gaylord. They had food there. They had booze there, which, of course, Hemingway liked. But then people were there, too. So Hemingway got to meet these, you know, Soviet trained generals and 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 just about anybody under the sun, frankly, that had a connection to the Soviet effort. For example, Hemingway became really good friends with a Hungarian general general who had also been a writer previously named Mate Zalka. He was known as Pavel Lukács was his alias. And Kaltsov made that introduction between Hemingway and Zalka, and they, they struck a friendship. And Zalka then ended up leading the international brigades, and Hemingway often would accompany them, Zalka's unit. Hemingway also met the NKVD chief Alexander Orlov, at the Gaylord. And from this meeting then, Hemingway was given a tour of the training, the guerrilla training facilities that, that our love was organizing. And then the relationship that I think is actually the most interesting and one that I uncovered just because of, of reading Russian as opposed to, you know, working with English language resources, is there was a, a gentleman named Haji Mamsurov, Haji Mansurov was actually the one who was running many of the guerrilla raids. He was going into working with the Spanish guerrillas. And Kaltsov introduces Hemingway to Mamsurov. And even though Mamsurov's a bit weird, weirded out by talking to Hemingway, because obviously he's supposed to be their secret and he's trying to pass himself off as a Spaniard and all these kind of things. Kaltsov says to Mamsurov, like, you know, look what we can get out of this. Like, this is important. And so, again, this is one of those moments where we kind of see, you know, that it was beneficial for both. Hemingway was getting access to this crazy information and, and Kaltsov was understanding what that would do for him. And so Mamsurov met with Hemingway several different times, explained to him the way that guerrilla warfare was conducted. And I'm quite sure that Mamsurov then ends up being kind of one of the, not the only, but one of the models for Hemingway's Robert Jordan, who's the main character in For Whom the Bell Tolls. And so again, this is a kind of a long way of saying that most of Hemingway's dispatches of the period aligned almost perfectly with Soviet propaganda. And the way we can check this, the way that I know this is true, is that at the same time that Hemingway is also writing dispatches back for Esquire and, and for other news agencies, Kaltsov is also writing his own dispatches for the Soviet press. And eventually Kaltsov will publish <clears throat> these dispatches in a collection called The Spanish Diary, which becomes incredibly popular in the Soviet Union. And if you look at the, the, the entries for The Spanish Diary around the same times as the entries or what Hemingway was writing at the same time, that they're pretty similar. And so it's clear to me, at least, that Hemingway was taking more or less what Kaltsov was providing and more or less turning it around and, and disseminating it. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. It seems like it was working out in that case, like exactly like they expected. So were there tangible or obvious benefits for the Soviet government? Were they getting exactly what they wanted out of this entire relationship, do you think? I believe so. I, in the course of my research, I've kind of developed this term that I call ideological profit. I'm kind of building off of a, there's a theorist named Pierre Bourdieu who has kind of come up with this concept of being able to build cultural capital that eventually you can change into financial capital. And this is, is within the realm of art, right? Art and literature. So, you know, stick with me here for a second. The idea is this, that, you know, before you can sell a, let's just, because it's a little bit easier to conceptualize, before you can sell a canvas with a splatter of paint across the front of it, there's all of these steps that have to occur that build cultural capital. So, right, you have a painter who splatters some paint on a canvas, but then there's all these other actors. There's a gallery that has to, or art collector gallery that has to first hang that piece of painting there. You have to have maybe an art critic write something about that splatter of painting. You have to have people that come to the show. And all this time, right, you're kind of building what is called cultural capital. This is this belief that somehow that painting with spattered paint on it is worth something. We don't know what yet. And then, of course, for Berdu, the moment that like the magic moment is when you actually have somebody that walks into the gallery and says, 
I'll pay you, you know, a thousand dollars for that canvas that has splattered paint. And this is the conversion of cultural capital into financial capital. Hmm. Well, the Soviets weren't interested in financial capital. Right. And so this is where my kind of innovation of Pierre Bourdieu's theory comes along and how I explain what the Soviets were getting out of Hemingway. For the Soviets, art and culture were used for political indoctr indoctrination. So literature, film and visual art were supposed to serve the state in order to, to transform Soviet citizens into good communists. Therefore, I look at the investment that Kaltsov and the other Soviets were making in Hemingway in these terms. Karl Tsov made it possible for Hemingway to gain access to people and to information. And the payoff for the Soviets was that he then published basically Soviet propaganda. And the payoff, the, the, the return was not financial capital, but ideological capital. So, you know, when Hemingway repeated the Soviet propaganda in his dispatches that were then published in the West, the Soviets did in fact feel like they had rec recouped their initial investment in Hemingway, but in ideological terms, not financial terms. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's a very, very far reaching thought process. Honestly, I feel like they've always been very, very good at that sort of influence and ideology, much better than we are here in the U.S. I think we're kind of ham-fisted with things like that, and they become like blunt propaganda, in my own opinion. And it seems like the Soviets were much better at the, the subtleties required for this sort of thing. Do you think then that for this ideological profit, were they intending for... <sighs> Were they intending to target the Western audiences or was it also for like the Soviet citizenry who would later be able to read Hemingway's dispatches in the Western press? It was mainly, I think, for the West, okay. frankly. You know, just even today, you know, we look at what's happening with Russia and the Ukraine today. You know, this information warfare, this is not something new. You know, information warfare has been around forever. The Soviets were much better at it early on than we were, than the Americans were and the British. I'm sure your listeners know that there's a long tradition of kind of a, you know, intelligence service, even in imperial Russia and certainly, you know, in the Soviet Union. And so when the Americans got around in the 1940s after World War II to kind of regularizing military intelligence into, you know, the CIA and the British into MI6, the Soviets already had a very long kind of run at this. And as your listeners certainly know, the Americans love signal intelligence, right? Capturing a signal mm -hmm. here, there, whatever. But the Soviets have always been known for human intelligence. They like to cultivate people. They like to manipulate people. They like to engage in this kind of espionage. And so to me, what Kaltsov was doing with Hemingway was just the age old routine that the Soviets do. And of course, who is Hemingway really speaking to, he's mainly speaking to the West. I mean, yes, of course, Hemingway's works were translated into Russian, but but certainly Kaltsov and the NKVD and those people that were kind of facilitating this relationship were very excited about Hemingway kind of doing their bidding, if you will, and getting that information into Western publications. Hmm, that's amazing. Amazing stuff. So with Kaltsov was his primary contact and helpful with the with influencing him and showing him what needed to be seen. But did the Incaveta, did they take a, any more of a direct role in working with Hemingway? Did he have anyone attempting to recruit him or contact him or, or coerce him or anything like that at all while he was in Spain? No, I think, you know, I think Kaltsov, at least from my research, is the main figure in the sense that Kaltsov was providing Hemingway with access. Now, there were other people that Hemingway became friends with. He became friends with the, not so much so, but still with the Soviet writer Ilya Ehrenberg. Ehrenberg officially was a writer for Izvestia, the newspaper Izvestia. But much like Kaltsov, Ehrenberg had been allowed to travel widely in Europe, had cultivated relationships with left-leaning intellectuals. And so clearly, you know, he was also, if he wasn't probably an NKVD agent. He was in the employ of the NKVD. There's another relationship that's quite interesting. There was a documentarian, film documentarian named Roman Carmen. And Carmen was out there filming around the same time that Joris Ivans and Hemingway were making Spanish Earth. And, and 
Hemingway and Carmen become friends and remain friends kind of on and off until Hemingway dies. And even after Hemingway died, Carmen kind of strikes up a friendship with Mary Hemingway, Hemingway's final wife. And so we have to be careful with, with the Enkevede because, you know, there's agents, like pure agents, like Alexander Orlov is an Enkevede agent and station chief and spy and whatever. But the Enkevede used people within the Soviet Union, like journalists, like writers, like documentarians, because in some ways they could do this, the spy job without being seen as suspicious. I mean, if you're a journalist, your whole job is supposed to be go cultivate relationships, go ask questions, you know, mm-hmm. build your own network of informants, da, 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 da. I mean, in many ways, what, the, what a journalist does is what a spy does, but they get to do it out in the open. And so this is why we see somebody like Kaltsov, who was a journalist, but probably also worked for the NKVD. Same thing with Ilya Ehrenberg, same thing with Roman Carmen. So when you ask me, like, you know, was Hemingway approached or cultivated or whatever, kind of yes, but in a way that seemed benign to him because these people were fellow journalists, you know, fellow filmmakers. And so it's interesting that Hemingway maintained these relationships Forever, He was always very loyal to people who he had met in Spain and who had supported the, the Spanish Republic. And so, you know, <clears throat> even with the distances, Hemingway had a relationship or maintained a relationship with Roman Carmen on and off, maintained a relationship with Ehrenberg on and off. He had re- maintained good feelings towards Kaltsov, even though he, it's very odd, it doesn't seem that he really truly understand that Kaltsov was executed in 1940. So, you know, Hemingway didn't see these people as NKVD agents who were manipulating them. him. He saw them as other people who were supporting the Republican effort in Spain. That was important to okay, him. Okay. Okay. I see. Was, do you think at any point he became aware that he was kind of being shown what they wanted him to show, even in a very subtle way? I mean, did he like even later in life, did he realize that, you know, his friends had had, you know, very, very specific ideologically aligned objectives with everything that they discussed with him? I, I, I think he did, at least on a passive level. And I'll explain to you why I think that. First, we have to understand, right, that in 1924, Vladimir Lenin died without any kind of succession plan. And the the two viable, let's say, candidates to take over after Lenin was, of course, Joseph Stalin and Lev Trotsky. And it took a little while, but Stalin eventually won this kind of internal political battle. And Trotsky, as we know, was forced to flee Soviet Union and eventually went to Mexico, right? And once Stalin had semi-control of the Communist Party within the Soviet Union, he started looking around and saying, I need to eliminate other political rivals who old Bolsheviks who maybe knew Lenin or were friends with Lenin. And so he begins what is called typically known now as the Great Terror. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to eliminate any political enemies who could vie for power for him and certainly those people who had supported Trotsky. And so he starts looking at Trotsky's supporters, but also anybody who might be anti-Stalin. And this began what was called the purge or the great terror within the Soviet Union. What's interesting is he was doing the exact same thing in Spain at the exact same time. So what's crazy about the Soviet effort within Spain during the Spanish Civil War is there were, as I alluded to earlier, there were these internal fights. So yes, theoretically, the Republic is fighting the nationalists who are, you know, funded by the Nazi Germany and, and fascist Italy. But even within the Republic, there's now an internal war that's occurring between the Stalinist and anti-Stalinist factions. And the NKVD is running really nasty purge efforts among Trotsky loyalists in Spain. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is where we see somebody like George Orwell, who will eventually write homage to Catalonia, where he's recognizing, oh my gosh, you know, this is occurring, right? The, the great terror is occurring in Spain as well. Okay, now that's the preamble. I'll get back to Hemingway. Does Hemingway know that effectively he's on the side of Stalin? Well, he knows he's getting his information from Kaltsov, and Kaltsov is clearly the eyes and ears of Stalin, right? 
We know for a fact that his friendship with John Dos Passos at this time comes completely apart. And part of the reason, again, is this kind of purge that's occurring. And the purge caught up one of Dos Passos' friends, Robles. And Hemingway, to John Dos Passos' face, is basically saying, you know, Robles probably got what he want, or what he deserved, oh. right? Here's the one thing that I uncovered that I, I think is really fascinating. So there's a famous fist fight that occurred between the writer Max Eastman and Hemingway. And the story has always been told that the fist fight was because Eastman had written a really harsh criticism of Hemingway's Death in the Afternoon, challenging supposedly Hemingway's masculinity and all this stuff. Mm. However, I went back and I reread Eastman's account of what happened. And it's really telling because Eastman was originally, had gone to the Soviet Union, had met Lenin, had met Trotsky, and eventually actually had written Trotsky's first English language biography. And so he was originally very much embedded kind of with the Trotsky side of things. And if you read Eastman's telling of the same story, Hemingway comes to Maxwell Perkins' office, where both Maxwell Perkins is the literary agent for both Max Eastman and for Ernest Hemingway. Eastman says to Hemingway, are you know, are you are you really kind of going with these these Stalinists? And this is what actually seems to really upset Hemingway. And it's within a few more moments after that that then Hemingway brings up the the critical book review of Death in the Afternoon. And the next thing you know, they're punching each other and rolling around on Max Eastman's floor. And then it turns into this big celebrity thing. But if you go back and read it, right, it seems to me that Hemingway is really upset that that Eastman, who was a Trotskyite to some degree, is calling out Hemingway for being a Stalinist, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. So again, this is my reading of the situation, but I don't think that Hemingway could completely be oblivious to the fact, right, that there were these two camps and that he certainly was on the cult so of Stalinist side, not the Trotskyite side. Hmm. So did he ever, I don't know if I should use the term come to his senses, but did he ever kind of realign after that? Did he kind of distance himself from the Koltsov and Stalinist camp after that in some way? Yeah, to a certain degree he did. You know, he went after, so after the, the Republic fell, Hemingway went and wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls. And now he no longer needed Kaltsov's direct help, right? He had already gathered all of his information. And so his tone and tenor changes quite a bit in For Whom the Bell Tolls. So yes, I, I, I do think that on some level he understood that he didn't have to toe quite so close to the Stalinist line once the Republic fell. I will say, and, and we'll probably get to this maybe a little bit later in in the interview as well, but but you know, Hemingway was still willing to work with the NKVD in the 1940s. And I argue in my own research that there was a possibility, had he not killed himself, that he would have maybe worked with them again in the 1960s. Hmm. So in some ways, yes, he was able to disengage from being, say, a Stalinist loyalist. I mean, that would be that would go too far. But he never completely abandoned the Soviet side of the equation. Hmm. That's amazing. I feel like that really just comes as a big shock to a lot of the, the more casual Hemingway readers, you know, people that read him in school or kind of vaguely familiar with him just as a cultural icon that he would have such ties, long lasting ties of one sort or another to the Soviet government like that. That's really eye opening, honestly. Yeah. I mean, for Hemingway, it wasn't the Soviet government per se. Hemingway was very loyal to certain friends Mm -hmm. and friendships that he made there. But I don't think that Hemingway was completely oblivious to the fact of who they were. Right. And I did recently kind of uncover in the 1940s when the Soviet or when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, Hemingway actually sent a couple kind of telegrams of support, if you will, one to the Red Army and one to the Soviet people, kind of like, you know, buck up, you know, we knew anti or, you know, we knew fascism was evil kind of thing. So, I mean, he certainly in this kind of larger equation of you're either a fascist or you're a communist, he certainly was hedging more towards communism than he was to fascism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can certainly see that a lot of people were as well around that time period. So I think very early on, you mentioned that he kind of fell out of favor for about 15 years or so until the mid-1950s? How exactly did that occur? 
Yeah. So, so the, you know, if we go back to my idea about ideological profit, right? The Soviets had invested all this time and energy in him through Kultsov and through others. And Hemingway goes to Cuba to write his next great novel, which is going to be about the Spanish Civil War. And of course, the, the, the Soviets are just, this is going to be the real payoff. You know, if, if the Soviets come out looking great in this novel, you know, every, everything that they invested in Hemingway will be realized. The problem, though, is, is we have a couple different things that happen. One thing is that Hemingway, when he goes off to Cuba, he says, I'm going to write the, the, the novel and tell the story of Spain that I couldn't tell previously. Well, he clearly realized he had to toe the line for Kaltsov while he was getting information. So when he gets to Cuba, right, he, he really takes a harsh criticism of the French communist André Marti, who is a real person, but also appears in the novel. He also is extremely har harsh on the Spani Spanish communist La Pasenoria. And on top of that, on top of being rather harsh about how certain elements of the war were organized and conducted by the Soviets, he also paints a very flattering picture of, of Kaltsov, who is the character Karkov in the novel. By this time, Kaltsov had himself been executed in the Soviet Union. So this culmination of things, right? Negative portrayal of Marti, negative portrayal of La Pasanoria, portrayal of Kharkov or Kaltsov means that when the Soviets actually get for whom the bell tolls and start translating it, all of these bells and whistles start going off and they're forced to have to review whether they're actually going to publish this or not. And Andriy Zhdanov, who was in charge of cultural policy at the time, said, no, nope, we're not going to publish this. Even though we still want to maintain friendship with Hemingway, we're not going to come out directly against him. We're not going to publish his novel. And frankly, For Whom the Bell Tolls was not published in the Soviet Union until 1968, so 28 years later, and only in an extremely redacted version. Hmm. And so, yes, from 1940 until 1955 or so, Hemingway becomes persona non grata. Some write that he, you know, that you couldn't talk about Hemingway or that, and that's not exactly true. Hemingway, you could still talk about him. You could still do those kind of things, but he was no longer being actively promoted the way he had been prior to 1940. Hmm. Wow. So you mentioned that Koltsov was already arrested and executed by this time. How did he go from being Stalin's eyes and ears in Spain to being targeted and killed like that? Like, what was that fall from grace about? Yeah. So it's sometimes really hard when dealing with Soviet politics, especially of that time period, the Stalinist period, to understand why one person, say, did not make it through the purge like Kaltsov and someone else who is very similar to him like Ilya Ehrenborg did. But in this case, I think we can make a kind of a, a clearer picture of the Kaltsov situation. Um, first, right, we have to keep in mind that because the Americans and the British and the French never entered into the war on the side of the Republic, Stalin started seeing the handwriting on the wall you know, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy were becoming more and more militant. The Soviets were looking to make alliances or friends or something. And the Americans and the British and the, and the French were not interested in helping the, the Soviets out. And so Stalin made a really radical pivot politically. He suddenly signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany in 1939. So anybody, anybody who had been helping with the Republican effort in Spain is suddenly on the wrong side, okay. you know, literally in, in, in one day. Wow. And so Kaltsov, of course, who had been the eyes and ears of Stalin in Spain, knew way too much. So that's certainly one reason. A second reason is that Kaltsov really was an enemy of or had clashed with Andre Marti, which is both depicted in Hemingway's novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and is part of the reason that Hemingway was so negative towards Marti in the novel. And so Marty, who was a French communist who was personal friends with Stalin, Marty had claimed that Kaltsov was a, a spy. Kaltsov had a, his lover was Maria Austin, who was a German communist. And so, of course, there was these allusions to him working with the German government. And probably another factor 
Koltsov liked to live dangerously, and he was a ladies' man, much to his own detriment. And for a short time, he actually had an affair with Nikolai Yezhov's wife. And Yezhov was, of course, in charge of the NKVD. So, you know, this isn't very smart, right, when you're sleeping with your boss's wife, especially your boss who can have you killed. And then there's kind of a final element to this. And I think that Paul Preston is is very right when he claims that Kaltsov had gained so much popularity because of his collection of stories and dispatches called The Spanish Diary that he really was seen as this kind of romantic figure. And so Stalin wanted to eliminate him. Not only did he want to shut down the kind of the excitement, the romanticism of Spain, but he also wanted to eliminate you know, Kaltsov, who came to represent that. So rather quickly after Kaltsov returned to the Soviet Union, he was arrested. He was tortured and forced to make a confession. And then Stalin signed his death warrant on the 17th of February, 1940. So basically Kaltsov goes into a trial where the, the verdict is already decided. He is found guilty, of course. And then either later that night or early the next morning, he was executed. This is how the NKVD worked this. It's not like you were found guilty and then you sat in prison for a while. They literally took you out and either shot you right then and there or they shot you the next day. Right, right. My gosh, what a rapid turn of fortune for that guy. Absolutely. I mean, the only thing I can really fault him for is having an affair with the uh, Incavidez boss's <laughs> wife. You know, that was a, a very yeah. poor choice on his part, but everything else, it sounded like he was doing exactly what he should have been doing up until it wasn't what he was, should be doing anymore. Absolutely. And, you, you know, this is a, this is what's kind of made my work a little difficult at first is because, you know, so once Kaltsov was, was executed, he basically disappeared, right? All references to him. No one could talk about him. No one could remember about him. Nobody could write about him. He wasn't rehabilitated until the 1950s. And by that point, of course, it was hard to recover information Mm -hmm. about him. So, you know, he's this really dynamic figure on some level, almost like mythological in the same way that Hemingway turned out to be at certain times, right? And so I really find these two to be really fascinating parallel figures who, you know, actually met and and were part of the Spanish Civil War. And the only reason we know so much less about Kaltsov is because of from 1940 until 19, I think it was 54, 56 that he was rehabilitated. You couldn't talk about him. Yeah, what an amazing pair of individuals that was. And for them to meet like that under those circumstances, it must have been such a fascinating time period, fascinating relationship too. I can't get over it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You mentioned one guy earlier who I've heard of, Alexander Orlov. I know he's pretty well known even now. Can you talk about what happened to him after the war during the purges? Yeah, so, and you know, well, I'll tell you, and then, yeah, your re- listeners can read for themselves. So Orlov was obviously a high-level NKVD agent, and he saw the writing on the wall. Let's be honest, Kaltsov was not the only person coming back from Spain and then being arrested and executed. This was happening again and again and again to diplomats, to military leaders, to NKVD folks, whatever. Arlov was able to get his family, it's an amazing story, was able to get his family and defect first to Canada. And then he went underground in the United States. And he was able to pass back information to Stalin. And he basically said, if you don't touch me and you don't touch my family, I will not not give away any secrets about, you know, Spain or the NKVD or whatever. And that agreement held. It seems that Stalin did not send the NKVD after Arlov. I mean, he was in hiding, let's be honest. And Arlov kept his word too. But the moment that Stalin died in 53, then Arlov actually published you know, his his kind of memories of working for the NKVD. So your readers can look up the name <clears throat> Alexander Arlov and, and, and read, right, what he claims to have done as a high-level NKVD agent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he's a fascinating guy from what I know, and I haven't read as much as I would like to about him, but I do want to do an entire episode about him one day because he is quite an interesting guy and quite a controversial character in some ways, too, as are many people that I've, I've talked about here. But yeah, very, very interesting guy. And just it's amazing that, you know, Hemingway kind of touched on his life as well around that same time period. It's really quite amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what happened with Hemingway 
like during and after World War II, what happened in the later years of his life? Did he kind of maintain contact with anyone after Koltsov disappeared? Yeah, so he did he did kind of try to maintain those friendships. I mean, here's the interesting thing. The the Soviet government continued to cultivate a relationship with him. So I've gone through the archives. I've been through the Russian archives in Moscow. I've been through the, the Hemingway archives in Boston. Last summer, I spent time in the archives at Princeton University. And it's amazing how much was sent to Hemingway from various entities within the Soviet Union. So there was a, a journal called International Literature, and they were the ones that mainly translated and published his works. And so their editors would regularly write to him and say, hey, we're translating this, we're publishing this. If you have anything else you'd like to give us, da da da, da. There were other entities that were constantly soliciting from him something like, for example, on the Jubilee anniversary of Maxim Gorky's death, they asked, you know, if Hemingway would write something about his memories of Gorky. Hemingway never did that. He didn't actually particularly like Gorky or his works. But the point is, is that there's just all of this material evidence, right? That Hemingway regularly was getting correspondence and information and magazines from the Soviet Union. So yes, his it's not like suddenly the Spanish Civil War is over and everything ends in no way, shape or form. I, as I said to you before, he remained extremely loyal to people he had known in Spain, including Right, Some of his Soviet contacts, Roman Karman and Ilya Ehrenberg being the two most obvious. So yeah, he he cultivated those relationships and and remained loyal to those relationships. Hmm. Amazing. I think also he came to the attention of other intelligence agencies like the American intelligence agencies around that time period as well, didn't he? Yes. And there is this fascination. I mean, clearly, I don't think that Hemingway was working with Dan Kavide for ideological reasons. Like, I don't think he was doing it because he was somehow a communist deep down in his heart or something like that. I think he was intrigued by this whole question of espionage. We know for a fact that when he and Martha Gellhorn went to China right after they got married, upon his return, he had meetings and, and wrote a report on what he had seen in China and his meeting with Chiang Kai-shek. We know that once the war started, he wanted to run basically an information ring. It's been called jokingly the Crooks Factory, where he actually was allowed to kind of collect information about what was happening in Cuba, you know, related to possibly German efforts to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. We even know the crazy story of him arming his boat Pilar with enough weapons to supposedly be able to board a German U-boat if it surfaced. And, you know, we have to, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy story, but, and then we also have to keep in mind that his oldest son was in the OSS, right? And so Hemingway had this attraction to just espionage, I think, writ large. And so, so yeah, he was involved in that. For those people that are really kind of interested in that, again, it's not really my side of, of the Hemingway story, but there is a book by Nicholas Reynolds called Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures 1935 to 61, where Reynolds actually talks a lot about that interest, right, in in espionage, Hemingway's interest in espionage. Okay, yeah, I'll have to read that for sure. I have not read that one yet, but it sounds fascinating. I mean, this guy, what a life he lived. It's just really incredible how many different touch points there were throughout his life, just different phases of his life and different venues and all that. It's really amazing stuff. He He lived life to the fullest, certainly. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, at some point you have to wonder how much of Hemingway's mythology, certainly later in life, he began to embrace. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he was a larger than life character and he created many stories about himself that actually weren't true. I mean, he claimed that he had fought, you know, with the Italian expeditionary forces and things. But it's almost like later in his life, you know, those kind of white lies that became bigger lies, he begins to actually believe some of them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and I, I do think that that may explain kind of some of his interest in espionage in the 40s and, and 50s and 60s kind of thing. Okay. Okay. I see. So speaking of later on, you mentioned that, of course, Stalin died in 53 and a lot changed in the Soviet Union. And he was kind of no longer persona non grata after 55 or so. So did the Soviet government try to kind of reinitiate that relationship with him again, like formalize it in any way now that, you know, Koltsov was long out of the picture? 
Yeah. So actually there's, in my own research, I argue that there were kind of three approaches. The first approach, of course, was in Spain in the 30s. And I think that that was probably the most productive relationship because they actually got Hemingway to publish things that was kind of pro-Soviet. But even before Stalin died in the 1940s, they reached out to, we know for a fact that when Hemingway and Gellhorn were in New York for their honeymoon, they had just gotten married. Hemingway actually takes a meeting with a guy, his American name was Jacob Golis, but Yaakov Golis, who was an NKVD agent. And, you know, I, we don't know exactly what was said, but I can only imagine, you know, that Hemingway is asking about his friends in the Soviet Union. And, you know, Golis is kind of saying, you know, well, we know you were great friends with Ilya Ehrenberg and Roman Carmen and playing to that. Anyway, Hemingway at this meeting agrees to work with the NKVD to the point where they actually have this kind of material passport. They have these stamps that they agree to, these Cuban stamps that if somebody approaches Hemingway and says he's a, you know, basically working for the NKVD and produces one of the stamps that that's a way to tell, right, that he's really NKVD. They go so far as providing Hemingway with the code name Argo. And they're kind of building this relationship. But all of a sudden, you know, of course, World War II starts and Hemingway goes and becomes a foreign correspondent covering the war. And so it's hard to maintain that. We know they had, after the New York meeting, they had at least one or two more meetings in Havana, one meeting in London right after Hemingway got to London. And then after that, it, it, it kind of goes dark, right? Because Hemingway's doing his thing. He's he's covering the war embedded with an American unit, right? He, he takes over. He goes in when Paris falls. He's one of the first people in Paris. Later, he's embedded with a group during the Battle of Hurtgen Forest. So anyway, he gets back to Havana after the war, and then Kavide tries to reestablish the relationship, but it never kind of takes. And so the file that we know exists or existed in the KGB files basically said that Hemingway never produced anything of value. Hmm. Okay. So th that's the kind of the 1940s. Then, of course, if you think about American politics through the 1950s, you have the McCarthy era, right, with the Red Scare. And this really isn't the time for Hemingway to be cultivating any relationships with the NKVD. So, you know, clearly nothing's happening there. And then I, I have uncovered one more moment where I think there was potential. So Hemingway's living in Cuba, obviously. Fidel Castro, there's a Cuban revolution, right? Fidel Castro actually turns to America first for support and the Eisenhower government isn't comfortable with that. And so the Russians step in. And Anastas Mikoyan, who was the, probably the second most powerful man in the Soviet Union, comes over and meets with Fidel Castro. But Mikoyan is a huge Hemingway fan. And so he wants to, to see Hemingway. And so they, he calls and they, they agree that Mikoyan and his entourage can come over to Finca Vigia, which is, is Hemingway's house there in Cuba which Mikoyan does. Mikoyan brings a bottle of vodka. Hemingway and the rest of them get quite drunk very quickly. <laughs> but what's interesting to me is that there was one reporter in that group and his name's Genrik Baravik. And Baravik is actually still alive. When I was last in Russia in 2019, I, I called Baravik and I tried to get a hold of him, but I couldn't get him. But there's a lot written by Baravik about his experience there. Baravik, like Kultsov before him, was technically a journalist. He tried to establish a relationship with Hemingway. And it's my belief that this was the third attempt by the NKVD to create a relationship hmm. with Hemingway. Unfortunately, though, Hemingway committed suicide shortly after their meeting. And so obviously it didn't go anywhere. But, but it's my belief that that was the third approach. Hmm. My gosh, they were persistent, weren't they? But I can obviously see the value in reestablishing that relationship under any circumstances that were possible. Sure, sure, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I, I kind of in my own book say, you know, Hemingway had said several times throughout his life, you know, that he wanted to go to the Soviet Union and it just never happened. But can you imagine if he hadn't killed himself, right? If his health had been better, he had killed himself. And if somehow Genrik Butterwijk and the others had been able to like, wrangle Hemingway to 
come to the Soviet Union and hunt and fish and da 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 da. Again, the ideological profit, right? The information war, the just pure propaganda of having Hemingway in the Soviet Union in the 1960s would have been immense. Absolutely, absolutely. My gosh. So you mentioned your book. When is that going to be published, by the way? Yeah, so it's everything got slowed down quite a bit during COVID. I, I, I as you, as it did for everybody else, right? Mm-hmm. It interrupted the process, and I wasn't able to get to archives. I've only now started getting able to access those the final documents that I want to see. So I do have a full kind of first draft, rough draft of my entire book that basically begins kind of 1920s all the way through 1990. 1990s. I need to now clean it up and make it readable. So I'm hoping that maybe by 2025, my book, Ernest Hemingway and the Soviet Union, will be in bookstores. Okay. Yeah, fascinating. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to that because this has been such an amazing talk about an amazing guy, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Great. It's fun. It's a fun project. Yeah, I, I can imagine. So how long did it take you to put all of this research together just for the first draft out of curiosity? Yeah. So I, again, I, you know, it kind of came in waves because I started probably about 20, oh, I want to say probably about 2018. No, earlier than that, probably 2017 with just the translations, looking at the Mm -hmm. translations of, and that being the main issue. And then I got the opportunity to go to the Hemingway archive at the JFK library. And it was there that I started seeing all of this correspondence coming from the Soviet Union. And it, obviously fascinated me. So I was able to get quite a bit done. I was able to get to the JFK library. And then the following uh, summer, I was able to get through the National Endowment for the Humanities summer stipend to go to what's called Ergali, which is the Russian Soviet archive where there's material in Moscow. And so I had made a big push and gotten very far right before COVID came, right? And then I still needed to get to Princeton, which I have now done. So, you know, if you think of 2017 to about 2019, then everything kind of slows down. And then, you know, after COVID had kind of receded beginning kind of last year, 2021 or so, 22, I was able to start going to places again. So I would say of kind of concerted effort, this has been about four years or so, but, you know, with a couple years in between that were not as sure, productive. Sure, very understandable. Yeah, we were all there for certain. So, well, this has been wonderful. While people are waiting for your books, Fred, where can they find you online if they want to connect with you right now and read more of, some, of your current work? Absolutely. So I publish almost everything. I, I shouldn't say almost. I publish everything on academia.edu. This is a website where academics can put up their work and it can be downloaded. I think you may have to join academia.edu, but it's free. You just have to create a profile. The other place that I am active is in LinkedIn. There, though, I spend kind of more of my time concentrating on contemporary Russia. So I'll post a lot about the war in Ukraine or or things that I'm doing right now. So if you're looking for the Hemingway stuff, I would say academia.edu. If you're just kind of interesting and interested in Russia writ large, then LinkedIn is a good spot to find me. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, certainly a lot of my followers are very interested in that topic and they want to hear about it from someone who knows it well like yourself, obviously. So I think that you'll find a lot of interest there, certainly. Well, great. Thank you. This has been so nice. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it, doctor. Thank you so much for coming. Certainly. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.